executive director, Rebecca Ume Crook. She's an amazing lady. She's a force. A force, and she's she's the brains behind the operation. Welcome, Rebecca. She'll give us a couple of remarks. All righty. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. We've got some folks in the back. There are some seats up here. I promise I won't bite. Charmy won't bite you either. Come on in. Come on in. Um, Thank you for that beautiful intro, and wow, welcome to the first Reimagine Ed. My name is Rebecca Crook. Um, I'm a former teacher and principal, and I have the privilege of leading uh, Metis as executive director. It is so wondrous to be in the presence of so many people dreaming of and working for transformation of education. Um, We've got policymakers, we've got uh, parents, we've got practitioners, um, we've got funders, we've got concerned citizens, so just thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, the genesis, both of Metis and of this wild experiment of a gathering, um, is pretty simple. Metis is a collective of teachers, and education entrepreneurs um, and leaders working to change the face of education in Kenya. And we looked around and said, wow, there's a lot wrong. And if you've gone through the what is part of the exhibition, have we done that? Yes, amazing. You've seen that there's uh, a lot of injustices that are actually baked into our systems. And so this collective looked around and say, said, what is actually isn't acceptable. And what if, what if a better world is possible? What if we can be a part of co-creating that world together, not only for the well-being of ourselves, but for our children and for all of us, right? And so, you know, what, what do we do with that? For me personally, um, I'm guided by my grandfather, Bop, who turns 98 in January. And he would always say to me, Rebecca, don't be so worried about what other people are doing. Worry about yourself. What are you doing? Now, granted, he was most likely talking about the dishes when I was complaining about my two younger brothers who were, like, not pitching in. But I think the lesson still remains. What are you doing? What am I doing? And so in that spirit, uh, this collective then asked, can we move from what is to what if? And I think you've seen over 40 exhibitions of locally led, evidence-backed, contextualized education innovations around the room. And these are folks who are asking bold questions. They're asking, what if libraries could be centers of community and creativity? What if dance could be a vehicle for teaching life skills? What if music could be a potent pathway to mental well-being, right? And, and when we start answering these questions, or rather asking them, they lead us to other questions, not only about what we build, but how we build. And so we ask as a community, what if we centered the voices of children and young people? What if we supported proximate leaders? Because at Metis, we believe those closest to the problem are also closest to the solution, right? What would it look like if we supported and resourced and listened to those voices? What if we ceded power to the leadership of proximate leaders? What if? Okay. And so as we move, um, I think we're surrounded here. Look around you. You are surrounded more people, by more people than my team expected. <laughs> um, but you're, you're surrounded by a really potent collective of people who are asking and doing their best to answer these questions with their lives, who are taking this moment that we're in right now in the midst of a pandemic that keeps evolving. And they're, they're being brave with their lives and they're saying, Let's build the answers together, right? Because we can't go back to what was. There is no going back to what normal was. 
we see in the exhibition, you talk to our kids, you talk to teachers here, you take a second sitting with your own self and you know that what was was never good enough, right, for us, okay? And in fact, what if a better world is, in fact, possible? So as we ask these questions and work towards answering them together, I just want to say welcome to you. Thank you for being here. I hope you find uh, tools and resources and approaches that inspire you, people with whom you can collaborate and conspire with in building this world. And I hope you find, most importantly, the community you need to sustain the energy and motivation it's going to take uh, to do right by our kids, right? So thank you for being here. Thank you for asking and answering these questions with us. Um, and, it, and if you haven't already, we encourage you to, to explore what is, what if, and then ask yourself, what now? What role might I play? And I think um, we can get some wisdom, actually, from my grandfather. If we go back and we actually iterate on his question, not only what are you doing, but what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Um, so thank you for being a part of answering that with us. As you can see, we're still figuring it out. <laughs> And um, we're just so grateful to get to build a more joyful and just world with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Those are wise words. And again, we, I think the take home here is what can I do going forward um, from here, from what you've seen in what is the current state of education in Kenya, um, and what if the possibilities, there are various innovations, people have come up with amazing solutions in their various areas, and then there's what now? So I have seen the possibilities, I have seen the current situation, what is my part to play? Ask yourself that question and make that commitment to yourself, living here, that this is the one thing I'm going to do after this to make a difference, all right? Are we together? Yeah. If we are together, um, can you say reimagine re Ed with me? Imagine Ed. Again, reimagine Ed. We are reimagining education for our children, for ourselves, and our children's children, and the future generations to come. So, up next, we'll have a panel discussion from um, amazing, amazing speakers of the day. And I would like to invite um, Wihaki to, to come and um, moderate. She'll be our moderator for the panel discussion. Um, just a little about Mwihaki. She's the founder and chief story smith at Paukwa. She's the chief story smith um, at Paukwa. She's also a Metis Cohort Three Fellow. Um, Mwihaki loves words spoken, written, set against a rhythm in a book or a poem. So she's an amazing, amazing um, writer. Paukwa House, which is the organization she founded, um, is a story house dedicated to showcasing and sharing positive stories from the continent. Paukwa has developed over 1,000 stories around historical and contemporary facets about Kenya and has been rolling stories and content out to Kenyan children um, to highlight hope, to reframe opportunity, and embrace our diverse and powerful selves. She's currently exploring ways to bring her African story to life through short story fiction collection. That's, that's amazing. Can we give her a hand as she comes? <laughs> Thank you so much, Rose. How are we doing today? Can I make a confession? This is the first time I've come to a public gathering like this since COVID started. It feels a little weird, but familiar. Pamela Kidogo, yeah? And I'm excited to be in this room in particular because you know what? This is a room of my fellow tribesmen. People who are like, I am disturbed but I'm ready to make a change. Are we not those people? Put up your hand if you're that person. Are you of my Kabila? <laughs> do you see what we can do? 
We can take a word that feels uncomfortable for us in this country and turn it around and make it powerful. That's what we want to do this afternoon, to reimagine Ed. Let me start off with a little story, because as you heard, I do like them. You may have seen a little video as you came in here, which was about a project that my team and I ran a few years ago called Our Kenyan Alphabet. I don't know about you, but me, when I was growing up, A was for? Or Epo. F was for? Fish. Me, I had folks, even. And B was for bear. And the worst, the worst was letter Y. Huh? Uh huh. Yachata, yacht, yacht. It's confusing. Let us just be honest. Yeah? It is just here to bring confusion. As you walked in, you saw a statistic there about literacy in Kenya and how many children are struggling with it. The first thing that a child learns when they go into kindergarten or nursery is the alphabet. And if we as a country are still using an imported alphabet to try and bring to children a concept which is already unfamiliar, is it no wonder that we're struggling? We decided as a country more than 50 years ago that English was one of our languages, but we have refused to make it ours. We said it's time, as my team and I. And what we said is that we want to be able to have children recognize themselves from the very beginning of their educational journeys. And so we went and we found a school which had children from 47 different counties, both boys and girls, which isn't very common in our reality, right? Both boys and girls in secondary school, 47 counties. Thankfully, the teachers and administration of the Mpesa Foundation Academy opened their arms and welcomed us. And we sat with 13 and 14 year olds and we put them into groups uh, balanced by gender, diverse by community and location, and we asked them to come up with reference words that they could explain to the five-year-old in their life. And we wanted to come up with one, two, and three syllable words and create together with children of this country a Kenyan alphabet. One of the best little um, groups that I came across was the group that was working on the letter G. And in that group, there was a young girl from Meru who was like, G is from Gambut. <laughs> Unequivocal, yeah? Right, yeah? But there was a boy from Kwale in her group who said, me, I can't explain to the five-year-old in my life what a gambut is. Kweli aula. Yeah? Because people of Pwani have no need for gambuts, right? So we went through this design process and hashed it out, and we said, eventually, let's get to letters which do what? A couple of things. One, celebrate our intrinsically Kenyan selves, because no one else is going to do it for us, right? Number two, Let's also recognize that we are African. So there's things in that alphabet, such as E is for elephant, which you will find are, you know, sort of unique to us, and H is for hyena. Then we said, but we're also members of this very human and universal race. So there must be things which speak to our universal human experience. So S is for sun, and F is for flower. And the last thing we said is that we also want to have a citizenship agenda. Because we know as Kenyans we are grappling with this idea of our own identity. And so N became for Nairobi, K became for Kenya, and V for vote, right? Because this is how we start to seed in children themselves, appreciation of other, inclusivity, all of these ideas. And the wonderful thing is that there's groups all over this exhibition hall, who are doing the exact same thing, thinking inclusivity, thinking co-creation, and moving forward. That excites me. That ex I mean, I don't know if it excites you. It excites me. Because we have decided it is time, and we want to make a difference. So today I have the esteemed honor of moderating and guiding a conversation between a couple of people who have traveled very different and diverse journeys and find themselves in this same space where they're trying to reimagine 
Ed. So allow me to introduce my panel today, and I'll ask them to come up after I um, read each of their bios. Shiro Waidaka is the founder and CEO of Fun Homes and Fun Kids Africa. Makofi Tafadhali. She is a serial entrepreneur. Serial entrepreneur, not tenderpreneur, yes? She actually makes things, creates solutions. And she co-founded Fun Kids and Fun Homes. She's been recognized as a role model as her company recycles timber in Kenya for school furniture and upcycles material as well. Her company empowers youth and manufactures sustainable products. Shiro graduated with a degree in interior architecture from the Glasgow School of Art and the University of Glasgow. Uh, prior to founding Fun Kids, she successfully ran her own architecture consultancy called Amber Africa for more than a decade. And I will say that we were even in the same high school once upon a time. Yes. Shiro, welcome to the stage. Our second panelist, you may know if you're of the radio waves or of the TikTok, because those are two very different generations. Blinky Bill, musician and producer. Blinky! Uko! <laughs> Blinky Bill, as he's well known, Selanga, is a Kenyan musician, producer, and DJ. And you can ask him, where do people go to school to become those things, yeah? On top of all of that, he's a TED Fellow and a Red Bull Music alumnus. His music is a mix of African sounds, electronica, hip hop, funk, and jazz. He was a founding member of the electro funk Just a Band. Just a Band? Yeah, we know them. <laughs> with whom he released three albums. He has collaborated with Chance the Rapper, played at the Cape Town Jazz Festival, and was named to the Yerba Buena Center of the Arts 2018, a hundred list of people shifting culture and creating change. Kabila wetu. <laughs> Karibu Blinky. Pamela Awar Omondi. She's a 21 year old student currently pursuing her diploma studies in education and community studies as a second year student at Egerton. So, as the rest of us, Okay, let me, you know when I say us, I just assume that everybody's the same age as me. Some of us left learning a long time ago, right? So we may be a little distance, we may be parents, we may be policy makers. We have representation from the people who are in the system today, and Pamela is representing them. She also identifies as a teacher, a mentor, she's a scout, a facilitator, she's an activist, member of Red Cross, environmentalist, and a feminist. She serves on the Imaginable Futures Youth Advisory Council. Pamela, Karibu Sana. I'd like to invite our last panelist. Because, as you can see here, and I promised you, the panel will be diverse, right? Our last panelist represents the institution that we all work with, and that's the government of Kenya. Ruth Mugambi is a technical advisor to the Permanent Secretary on Curriculum Implementation and the CBC. In fact, people just call her Tiwe by CBC. Eh? <laughs> Ruth, <laughs> Ruth was a secondary school teacher and she's dedicated the last 30 years of her life to serve in the public education sector. She's passionate about education, her children are in the sector. In fact, she even has grandchildren right now. But, so if you want to talk to her about CBC, she has investments in CBC on many, many levels, right? She works in curriculum development, and she's the chair of the technical committee uh, with regards to the framework and the design of the CBC. And for her efforts at being the chair of that committee, she was then plucked out out of KICD after that work and told, okay, now go and implement. You know the way that consultants come and give you grand ideas and then they're left, and then organizations are left to implement? She's responsible for now implementing all the ideas that her committee came up with. So she's in it and she can tell us all about it. This is our panel today.
So I have questions for each and every one of them, and um, we're gonna kick off with Shiro. Shiro, what is your greatest hope for Kenya and for Africa? Good afternoon, everybody. Nah, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Better. Um, first of all, congratulations. This is huge. Um, it's all about education. Thank you, Mwihaki. We called her Haki in school. Um, my greatest hope for Africa is for us to love ourselves, for us to stop listening to the narrative that has been told about us. Africa is huge. If you look at the world map, somebody made us look small. And once you do that, then we think we're small. My greatest hope for Africa is for us to speak African, because we were once one. And then somebody decided to divide us, and then we fight for that which is ours. My greatest hope for Africa is for us to educate the world, because we have so much traditionally we knew, still know, but somebody told us it is savage, it is backward, yet they've taken and they sell it back to us. My greatest hope for Africa is for us to collectively rise, to stop fighting and stop believing the hype. Love ourselves, because when you know love, love is a verb, teachers, it's an action. We must love ourselves, love each other, and we must unite, and we must go forth, and we must show the world we are Africa. Thank you, Haki. Thank you. Hey, 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 hey. You, if you're not, if you don't have that same hope, you're in the wrong room. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> that was beautiful, Shiro. And I think that this is why we're here, because there's a recognition that unless we see ourselves and recognize the power inherent in who we are, there's no way that we're going to move forward in hope. Our aspirations will be killed, right? So I want to then turn the question then to Blinky, yeah? And I'm sure that you are probably of the same idea in terms of your hopes for Africa. If that is the case, and you can tell us if it is um, different, then what does reimagining African then education require of us, of us? What does it actually mean? Microphone check. That's normally how we start in my field. I think it's very important for us to reimagine education because we're in a world that's becoming the same, in a sense, where what, when something happens in another part of the world, we know about it. If some, like, I'm beginning to feel like what we need as well is the perspectives from, let's say, Kenya. The world needs that because it's not been represented fully in the way that, like, if you wake up and turn on your TV, you'll see a lot of information from the rest of the world. But we're not doing the same when it comes to what is it about where we're coming from and showcasing that to the world. I feel like the education system could be reimagined in such a way that we instill a lot more self-belief in ourselves and proudly talk about, yeah, I'm Kenyan and this is what we stand for. And I've gotten to travel a lot over the past few years, just playing music in different places. And a lot of times now, I understand why some things are the way they are. And I see also, like, we weren't taught this. Like, if you play in Nigeria, for example, Nigerians believe in themselves 100%. Um, <laughs> I'm Nigeria. Yeah. So there's a time I had a show. I had a show in South Africa, then came back to Nairobi, then went to Lagos. And the difference between, like, it was just a world of difference. And one of the things that, as Kenyans, that I've really fought against is that thing of you feel like we are sec like we are always welcoming other people's ideas, but never really strongly showcasing our ideas. And I think the reimagining that education 
needs to start with that. It's like we need to know what it is that we bring to the world. And also, like, be proud of it. I'll elaborate later. But. I absolutely agree with you. It's um, interesting. I was recently watching a documentary about World War II and the fight that took place in Burma. Now, we all learned about World War II, but I never learned about the Ghanaian, Nigerian, Gold Coast, Nyasa land, Ugandan soldiers who were all there. I knew there were a few Kenyan soldiers. I did not know about the West African Regiment. I did not know about, I had heard, I think, about the East African Regiment, but it struck me that why is it that when we learn even about world events, our Africanness, which was there, is actually missing? And is it a question of the education which we um, have inherited? Which brings me to you, Ruth. Then why is reimagining education important? What are we losing if we don't have these important conversations and steps towards reimagining? Uh, thank you, Mehaki, for this opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. Indeed, it is a pleasure for me to actually answer that question <laughs> because education is actually, we say, is the backbone to any development, social, economic, even self, the development of self. It is about education. Education is dynamic. It cannot be the same throughout because education is supposed to address the needs of the individual, the needs of their community, and the needs of the, of the country at large. So if the nation and the country is dynamic, then education has to be dynamic. When, we, when I entered the institute, we used to define education as the ability to acquire the acquisition of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values in order to change behavior towards a desirable direction. But the question we are asking ourselves today, what is that desired direction? We have to ask ourselves, at the end of education, what kind of a person do you want to produce? And, we, and that is why in CBC we have what we call a vision statement. We want every child to be empowered, engaged, and ethical citizen a Kenyan ethical, and I know you all know why we say ethical, but I'll not go into details, but we want them to be empowered. Empowered meaning that they have ability to perform a given function in whatever context they find themselves in. So we want to give them opportunities to acquire, and that is why we are talking about competencies, because our competency will en enable you to, to engage meaningfully in any situation you find yourself with. So we empower you, we provide you with the knowledge and skills. But we also want you to be engaged. Engaged is being able to apply what you have learned in your classroom in a, in a given situation. Engaged is the ability to do, to apply the skills and knowledge you have acquired. So we have to reimagine education because we are producing an education system for a future which we know nothing about. We are talking about the 21st century. Who knows what the 21st century will look like? Who knew that COVID was coming? Do we now go and change the curriculum because COVID has, a, has come? But we provide, no we do not, but we provide the curriculum with opportunities to adjust itself to the changing needs of the society. So the opportunities to plug in, um, to plug in issues of health. Health is one of the key pertinent issues. So there are opportunities for that, but if something else happens, the curriculum has avenues to produce that, and that is why we have to reimagine re education and not dream or imagine that it will be the same as it was yesterday. It has to be different. We have to imagine it, reimagine it, so that it continues to be adaptive to the changing needs of this country and the world and the individual at large. Thank you. It's so true. The conundrum, of course, is can the people who are or were um, educated in one system, be the ones to bring about that change. I was recently challenged by my son, he's 12, I think going on 26, but anyhow, um, he's a terrible speller. And I have brought it to his attention. And his response to me was, but when I put the words, when I type the words in word, that red thing comes underneath to tell me that it's spelled wrong, so why do I need to spell? Me, I was brought up on Better English. Do you remember that textbook, Better English? 
Yes. <laughs> and spelling was paramount. And the challenging thing is that I actually couldn't, I mean, I was, he was wrong, but also I realized that he rarely writes. Typing is his modus operandi. He's a digital native. So as you're saying, we need to prepare children for a world that we know not. And for those of us who are a little far from the learning uh, that has been rolling out of late, my question to Pamela then is, in the recent years, because you are representative of those who are currently still in the system, what was learning for you like when I was growing up? Just so that we can contextualize whether we're still talking about the same thing or not. You can have the mic. Hi, hey everyone. Hello. Hello. You should be happy <laughs> because they are all alive. Okay, learning for me while growing up wasn't easy because um, the curriculum had not changed. So learning was so difficult. Um, if I take, for example, from my school where I was learning at, um, the student's teacher's relationship was not good. It's not like the current student-teacher relationship. There was not that freedom that is in the current curriculum because the interaction between the teachers and the student was minimal. I don't know from your schools, <laughs> but from my school, the interaction was not good. And um, that was basically in most of the schools because the student feared the teacher. He is not able to approach the teacher so well and explain that I'm going through this and this. I'm not able to understand this and this. So learning was so difficult because there was no good teacher-student relationship. Another thing during my learning was that the parent, parent relationship to the student was not good. You come back home from school, you do your homework, you take your dinner and you go to sleep. The next day you wake up, you're still on your way going to school. Your parent is not there to check whether your assignment is done, whether your homework is done, whether your uniform is in good state. So you find that the parent-student relationship was not good compared to now, where there are rules set. There are some schools that rules are there that a student has to go with the number of uniforms to school. The student, the parent has to do signature for an assignment done. I don't know <laughs> if that is it, but that is what is happening currently. The parent has to sign for assignment that was done. So the parent, the parent learner relationship during my time of learning was not okay. Another issue during my learning was there were taboos. Girls were not allowed to relate with boys. Like um, during engaging, you find that girls were in a separate place and the boys were in a separate place. But currently, if you're very keen, both genders are engaging freely. So during that time, there were taboos that girls were not allowed to engage with boys freely. So learning was very difficult. Another challenge that I faced during while growing up in school was that um, the social well-being of every individual, like the physical education, the health education, the mental, mental, mental education of students were not keenly taken care of. But currently in most schools, you find that um, students are being mentored. There is a school regulation or there is a program that is allowing for every student to be mentored. Students are taking part in physical education, physical activities like the PE, games. They freely go and um, engage with other schools and they're socially built because they are learning from different people, different diversity. So they are able to engage with different people. So that was not there in the early learning because not every, not every school at the program or not every school was keenly empowered to allow that to take place for the physical development, social development, mental development of every student. Another challenge that I faced while growing, while learning, was that um, we were in schools that, back in the ghetto, we were in schools that were not well e equipped. They were not well resourced. So maybe there's a, someone that has a talent. You can dance, you can sing, and um, you, that talent, you're just with it there because now I'm in a school back in ghetto, there is nothing I can do with this talent. So that was a challenge because um, 
I have a talent, maybe I know how to draw, I know how to dance, I know how to do something that is, apart, that is different from what I'm being taught. That is different from the theory that I'm being taught in the books. But I'm not able to use it because I don't have the platform to. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. I'm going to turn to Shiro <laughs> and, and, and challenge you based on um, some of the things that Pamela has shared. Because just looking at the two of you, I think that you come from different generations. Yeah? <laughs> so, so my question to you, Shiro, is I know that you also um, come from an arts background. Is this reimagined education that we are now going through, this, this sort of process that we're moving towards, do you think it's going to take us to the Africa that we need, the one that you talked about, the one that you hope for, right? Especially when you think about some of the things which are less valued by ourselves, things like the arts, things like music, right? Which we all rely on every day because even just looking in this room, <laughs> the number of tailors who, <laughs> who have been promoted here, yeah? Are those not people in the arts? Shiro. How much time do we have for this question? <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, I hate the word talent. Oh, you have a talent. It is a career. It's not a talent. Okay? We don't have passion for what we do. You don't need passion. We have a skill that is paid for. Don't tell somebody paint for me because you're passionate or sing because you're passionate. Pay them for their skill. Sorry if you don't have a skill. <laughs> so do not use the word talent. Do not say you have a passion. You cannot feed your family on passion. It's a career. The tailors you're talking about are not tailors. We have big fashion industries. They're called conglomerates. They don't tailor. They make clothes that we all need, including underwear. Who here has made underwear with all your genius? It's industry. It's a business. We need to stop using words that put us down and make us small, okay? Who here is a cobbler? Who here is a cobbler? Who here is wearing a shoe? Shame on you. Okay? Um, CBC, thank you. You need to change it to innovate, challenge, question, lead. They are not here to do as they are told. They do here to question. It is their future, not ours, okay? They don't know, neither do we. We are supposed to be creating environments for them. Who here has ever dreamt of being a carpenter? Guy. <laughs> Nobody here wants to be a carpenter. Who here who wants their child to be a carpenter? Who here does welding metalwork? Who here teaches that? Are you kidding me? What are you sitting on? What are you sitting on? Chairs. Who made it? What do you sleep on? Who made it? What house do you live in? Who built it? I ask the question, who wants to be a carpenter? I am a carpenter. I have a factory in Kikuyu, and we are carpenters. And then we use technology. Technology is an enabler. It is not the end. So we use hand tools, and our machines also are computerized. We need to stop this thing of technical skills. They are careers. We need to stop seeing fashion as a thing. Without these fashion designers and tailors, how would we look? Boring. Naked. It's not so bad, but it can get cold, OK? We need to stop this whole thing of wearing white shirts in school. Nairobi is dusty. Kenya is dusty. It's hot, we sweat. Why aren't we giving jobs of school uniform, if we must, to the local tailors, fashion designers? Why does government make us wear central looking things? Why that child in Kuala and the one in Mandera compared to those in central? Why do they wear those sweaters? It's so hot. <laughs> and then we are playing. And what is this uniform for PE? Why aren't we just in shorts? and sneakers that we've made where we come from. Dear schools, dear learners, educators, why are you buying books and not planting fruit trees? Because the children are hungry. Without nutrition, it doesn't matter 
how amazing and how you reimagine education if they can't eat. If they can't eat, they can't think, they don't grow. We have a problem of malnutrition and obesity because we don't have the right food. Can you imagine going to school to beg for food? There is no dignity in education. You must reimagine and rethink and reset. Please, this is not a good to have conference. This is a crisis conference. Others, we are doing zero by our children. Look at children in class. The computer will do nothing if they have skibis on their heads, if they have kwasho core. Don't give them an app. Feed them first with food that's around them. Grow the trees. You have the land, we have the weather. Then give them a laptop. We cannot feed off apps. We cannot grow on apps. We cannot love ourselves with apps. We need to change this. You need to panic tomorrow, today, tonight. We need to treat this as an actual crisis. The pandemic is here. The one we don't talk about is lack of quality education in Africa. Good people, this is not a joking matter. This is not a ticking the box. If you don't love yourselves enough, you will never love the children of this continent and will never change education for them. Thank you. Thank you, Shiro. Like the children in front of us here said, you must look at the man in the, in the mirror. The change starts with each and every one of us. Blinky Bill, I was not joking when I said actually, how does a person become a Kenyan musician, producer, and DJ? Because me, when I went to school, those things were not there. Yet we have a whole industry in this country that is about people creating music. <laughs> Let me ask you, you know, when people wake up and they ostensibly go to WhatsApp for their morning devotion, first thing they see is WhatsApp, what's the latest? <laughs> my Instagram, TikTok, it's music, it's creation. How are we going to grow the next generation of producers who give us that identity and excitement and that danceability that we saw here? I think, I don't think that it's, it's ever been t something that's been taken seriously in terms of the education. Even when I remember when we were learning about music, and this is something that I've done over the years, is I've spent a lot of time remixing older songs. Because I, in my head, I've always felt like, I don't think that when this thing was made, it was hard in the, in, with the intention that the composer, whoever made it, wanted to. So it slipped through the cracks. And so when other people talk about their Bob Marley's, their Hugh Masekela's, their fellow Cooties, who do we talk about in Kenya? Because we've never taken it seriously. So, and we'd, we've had great musicians or great artists of different kinds in this country, but because we've never, we've always seen everyone else, but not the people who are here, even when you're studying about it, it's like, as a by the way, while if you look at someone like Banner Boy or, Fela, or Wizkid, they'll always tell you, I owe this to Fela Kuti. It's like we have our Fadili Williams, we have our... Uh, in fact, I was... Fadili Williams has been sampled by so many, like Harry Belafonte, Miriam Makeba. We don't know this. And so what ends up happening is that if we don't know, then we end up borrowing the info from the people that know. And we end up learning about people who... Anyway, to go to your question. <laughs> How did I learn all these things? It's because I'm passionate about it. I went to, I went to Kenyatta University and I studied sports science which was not really the, the course that I wanted to go to, but 
you know that time where you really don't know what you want to do. I knew I wanted to make music. I knew I wanted to be a musician for the rest of my life. But there was no one around me that was being supportive. Everyone was saying, this is impossible, this is impossible. But in my, in my head, I know that, okay, if no one's done it before, there's an opportunity for me to be the first person to do it. So if I remember my mom saying, ah, you're going to be playing in bars or things, because she doesn't know any better, and I can't even blame her. So eventually when I left KU, the key word is left. <laughs> it, yeah, not graduated, because it was killing my spirit, and I, it was is a decision that I've never regretted. If anyone told me, nah, I don't regret it. Because also I've ended up doing a lot of things that no one's done before, in terms of even previous Kenyan musicians. So the thing that I ended up doing is just YouTube University, where that's beca that became my university. And I started applying to a lot of courses where I could learn that, so I went to, the first fellowship I got was, it's called One Beat in the US, where you ended up, I studied al alongside 30 other musicians from around the world. Then the next year, Red Bull Music I cut. So really, if I look back at it, I don't feel like the education system here gave me wings. It was more for me to find it. And I don't think everyone else has that m motivation, for lack of a better word. But also sometimes, it's not even just that you're gonna be a, you need to learn music or art to be an artist, but it's just to improve your quality of life and living. So that you can know how to color coordinate nicely. Like I'm seeing everyone in the room here. It's like we need those soft skills. And, and f one final thing that I'm going to say, if you think about a Jamaica, which is such a small country, and you look at the impact that Jamaica has had on global music, for example, Kenya, we, we've, we've missed the opportunity of developing so many artists who could have been, who could have had that kind of impact. So when you come back and say there's no Kenyan sound, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. We have Kenyan sounds. The, the good thing about us is that we are so diverse. But when someone says we don't have a Kenyan sound, it's because we've never properly supported it. OK. So, so, so true. It's a funny thing. Mm -hmm. As Kenyans, we're a little obsessed with money. Can we just agree? I mean, sequel buyer. It is who we are, right? So a lot of people, young young people, when I talk with them, and they tell and ask them, so so what do you want to do in terms of your career? And they say, I need to find something marketable. And I keep telling them, excellence is the only thing that is marketable, right? You can decide you want to be a lawyer, an engineer. And let me tell you, Churchill. Churchill is what? He's a comedian. And I'm sure you used to get in trouble in school. Nyambane, <laughs> all of those guys. But what do they do? They do it with excellence. When you woke up this morning, I'm sure you all saw that video of Saudi Soul in their school. Huh? They all went back to Upper Hill. Yeah? And they were singing with their schoolmates. And I kept wondering, how many other Saudi Souls could we have had out there if there were more schools like Upper Hill which were thoroughly invested in music? And because we love our money, Saudi Soul, Soul Fest sold out in how long? 24 hours. So is it marketable? It's marketable. So Ruth, my question to you then is, how are we creating the next generations and finding spaces and innovating and allowing for the next Blinky Bills, the next Saudi Souls, the next um, Churchills, people who are not usually on uh, a path which requires an exam? but they have something and they could be built further through support. Okay, Mihaki, thank you for that uh, very difficult question. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think uh, it's important to recognize that 
when you run a national curriculum that is supposed to address the need of every child, the child who is malnourished and doesn't have food, the child who has too much food, the child living in a slum, the child living in a mansion, the child at the coast, the child in the lakeview, you want to give them one curriculum and what we are calling a national curriculum. So in the competency-based curriculum, which I can talk for hours about, it gives, that is why we talk about outcome-based as opposed to objective-based. Those are two different technologies. And the outcome-based gives an opportunity for the learner to apply whatever they have learned in their context. So if you're in the context of uh, this person, then you are able to apply it. When we talk about nutrition, you would understand your context. I am the one living in an, an, a place where there's not enough, isn't it? So where can I get it in my village? So it's about your context, what it is around. But maybe let me talk about CBC, and I'm happy that he is here, and I'm hoping that he can be one of our CBC ambassadors, because Child, we are trying to promote music in children, but our parents do not want their children to do music. So we need ambassadors to help us do this. So CBC is actually in three levels, which probably people don't understand because that is how it has technically been developed. There are three levels. The first level, we call it early years, and that is the child up to the age of uh, eight years. And our focus, and you'll be happy to hear this, is literacy, the ability to read, write, speak, and listen, the ability to use good language, appropriate language, social skills. So there are three things, literacy, numeracy, and social skills. That is the focus, and that's why you see that in CBC we ask children to speak a lot, to read a lot, they talk. And we are using the inquiry-based learning, where we are asking children to ask questions. If you don't know, ask. If you don't like being asked why, 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 we, ask, we are encouraging children to ask why, why, why is this that, why, why, because through answering those questions, they get to learn and form an opinion for themselves. But in middle school, that is between grade four and grade nine, we are offering a broad curriculum. Now, what is a broad curriculum? It's opportunities for learners to be exposed to almost anything, music, art, craft, uh, literacy, uh, literacy, um, literature, <laughs> woodwork, carpentry, <laughs> beadery, weaving, sewing, cooking, everything. It's broad. So learners can pick, and by the end, and it's the longest period of time. It's actually six years. They're just experiencing, they're just being exposed to different things so that they can be able to say, I love music. So by the time he finished, grade nine, he should have been able to say, by the way, I love music, and I would like to do something more in music. So that is why there's a lot of music that the learners will do, even in, in, in secondary school, even art, and whatever it is. It's a broad curriculum, exposing so that, so that you're able to know your abilities, you're able to know your interests, so that when you come to senior school, now it is where you are laying a foundation for specialization. You, you go into a, a career, uh, into a pathway, which you have chosen based on your interests and based on your abilities. However, you also have opportunities to do something else. Like if you decide you want to do f sports, for example, and you go to a, sports, a school that offers sports, and you find yourself in a situation where you are the fastest runner in your school, and now you realize, actually, I'm not so good in running. It could be there are other better. <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are other people who can do better. You, are, you can pursue it, or you can decide you have an opportunity to go somewhere else. So that is why we give you an opportunity to specialize in your ability, but also give you other opportunities in case you change your mind and realize that, actually, he gets to hobby. It is not really something I like to do as a, as a career, but something I like to do on the pathway. So that is how education is organized. And this is not unique to Kenya. It is mm -hmm. it's actually a global trend. Give learners opportunities to understand themselves. And that is why self-efficacy becomes one of our key core competencies. Understand who you are, self-awareness. 
Let me, many of our children have said, if you listen to them after class eight, I want to be a surgeon, I want to be a aeronautical engineer, and yet when they go on top of a building, they are unable to look down because they are scared of heights. <laughs> when it's an accident a situation, they cannot look at an injured person, and they want to be a medical surgeon. So they have to also look at their personalities. And, and, this, and this is why community service learning becomes important, where learners go in middle school to see what really happens in the workplace, so that they're able to ask themselves, can I fit in such a situation? So that becomes an extremely important aspect. And that is what we are trying to address, those things that were not there under the 844 system. Yeah. I feel sorry for you, Ruth, honestly speaking, because like you said, you're trying to service 50 million of us and our expectations and our expectations are all different. But when we interact with education as individuals, we interact with the teacher at the front of the classroom. That is what to us, or the headmistress or the principal of the school. And I want to turn the a question out to Pamela, right? To remind us about who we're dealing with in classrooms. If you came with that question, why, why, why? Teacher, why? Teacher, why? Why? Yeah. What sort of response would you get? Because I think that we need to start getting granular about who and what we need to change. OK. I need, we want to create a society that is full of love. And um, at the end of it all, we want to create a space that will accommodate everybody. So whenever a student raises his hand to ask you why, you're supposed to service the student with love. You're supposed to put yourself in the same position, that what if it was me inquiring from somebody, why have you done this? Why is this this way? So if it was me treating a student who is asking me, why, why, why this, why are we cooking? I, why are we singing in class? I have to take my time, make love to the student, like create love, create that space for this student to feel part of this system. You're supposed to, because at the end of it all, we want every student to be empowered. We want to create humanity for everybody. We want to achieve an education system that everyone is feeling part of it, everyone is feeling empowered. So I treat this student with love and um, with hope because at the end of it all, I want to achieve an empowered society. I want to achieve an empowered person, somebody who is enlightened, somebody who is also able to teach another person. Thank you. We need to change the relationships that we have in our educational spaces, whether it is at policy level, whether it is at classrooms, at communities, at boards. That is a wonderful end and a very, very good beginning for the rest of us. Please say thank you to this wonderful panel. Thank you so much, all of you. Hello, check, okay. Thank you so much. Um, you can take your seats. I can. <laughs> Thank you so much, our panelists. Um, wasn't that mind boggling? I don't know about you, but I'm going to have a meeting with myself after this. I will call myself to a meeting and we will discuss because I interact with children all the time, my kids, friends, and it's important to have that mindset of what kind of future um, do we want for these kids? Um, and even for adults, what kind of learnings um, do you want them to experience? Um, when Pamela was talking, I remember I had a deski, okay? For those who are in you know, Nairobi schools, I had a deski, and it was those long desks, and we used to put bags to separate us. You sit there, and I sit here, it was, a, it was a boy. So you sit there, and I sit here, and there's this huge separator to make sure that we don't interact. And we went to the extent of even doing a line on the desk itself with tape. 
like, don't cross here because I really don't want to interact with you because you're a boy. And I don't want to interact with you because you're a girl. So this kind of mindset has to change. And change begins with? With? Reimagine? Reimagine? Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, um, Mwihaki, for moderating. Um, so well, let's give her a hand. Very provoking conversations. Thank you to our panelists for making time to come and um, for just that very insightful conversation. So we are moving to an interesting section of our program today where we are recognizing um, people who have you know, gone out there and made a change and you know, tried to do their bit to make a change and we will be awarding them. And, um, and just charging them to just continue doing what they're doing. And for this session, I will be inviting Shami, um, who is the board chair at METIS, and she has supported METIS work since its inception. She also serves as Harambe's chief impact officer, ensuring that young people across Africa access the jobs and support they need through partnerships with government, the private sector, and civil society. That's such an awesome initiative. Welcome, Sharmi. Thank you very much, Rose. Firstly, can I just say how delighted I am to be here after nearly two years of COVID and darkness and despondency and believing that all is lost today gives me hope. I'm really grateful to you, Rebecca, but all of the Metis fellows, thank you, because you, as Rebecca mentioned, when you, when you describe the world that is, you are redefining what is possible. Each and every one of you Metis Fellows, regardless of whether you get an award or not, you have given me hope and inspiration that today we can build a better tomorrow. Thank you. So it gives me great pleasure to announce um, the purpose of this next segment, which is the Metis Awards, the first ever reimagined awards for, for, um, for Metis and for the community. And before I do that, I just want to take a moment to um, describe to you the values that METIS ascribes to. So the METIS community, I think for me, the, the most powerful part of the METIS community, firstly, is building a community of change makers. So that itself gives me hope and it fills me with excitement. But I want to read to you the values, which are a core part of the awards. So METIS's values, which I do have to read, are do hard things, go further together, listen and learn, redefine excellence, which we clearly have seen today, both with the panel and what you've seen coming in, and my favorite, I think, which is the last one, which is do small things with great love. So the two aspects of what makes these METIS awards are both the impact of the communities that the METIS fellows are making in advancing learning in Kenya and their ability to actually role model the values that METIS holds dear. How do we create a more just and equitable education system for all? These leaders, all of them, are paving the way. They are beacons of possibility and hope. And in this bleak, desperate year where we've heard stories of growing teen pregnancies, people dropping out of school, and people not learning, these are the lessons that we cling to. We need to celebrate them. Let's take a moment to celebrate hope in the moment of the pandemic, guys. Just please give a round of applause for just celebration of that, because too often we actually hold and cling on to the things that are wrong instead of actually celebrating what is going well. So these are the seeds of possibility and hope, and I'm so grateful that we're doing this today. Thank you. So without further ado, I, I have the opportunity for announcing the first award, which is the Award for Collaboration. And the first, the collaboration award will be presented to three people. And one of, as I mentioned, one of Metis's core values is going farther together. The proverb says, to go fast, go alone. To go far, go together. 
And these three individuals have really, truly represented that. And I'm not going to play around. The three individuals are Maria Omare, Sheila Lutta, and Eric Nemoiro. But specifically, <laughs> give them a round of applause. Let me tell you why. Firstly, um, I don't know if anyone knows what special day we're celebrating today, but today is the International Day of People with Disabilities, globally, right, December 3rd. And we, I'm really, really honored to actually call out this award to the three of these, these three METIS fellows for several reasons. Since 2015, the Maria's Action Foundation has provided direct services for children and families with disabilities in Nairobi's informal settlements ensuring that children and youth have the wraparound support they need to thrive. During her METIS Fellowship, we saw Maria grow from a small two-bedroom office in Kibera to a three-story community hub. Over the last year, <laughs> Maria has crafted innovative partnerships to reach more families and create a more inclusive society. And not just an inclusive one, but a transformative one. Not only in Nairobi, but across Kenya. Together with Eric, and the STEM Impact Center, and Sheila from the Ministry of Education, Special Education Directorate. Maria and the Action Foundation will reach nearly 3,000 girls with disabilities across Kenya's eight regions with STEM programming that will equip them with practical skills and career opportunities. Let's give them a round of applause, guys. And then, that's, that's not it. Um, these, these METIS fellows and METIS alumni are not only planning this cross-sector approach to disability skills development, but also crafted an award-winning proposal from Google.org, raising, get this, get this, 700,000 US dollars to fund and implement and scale this. Congratulations to Eric, Sheila, and Maria. Please come, please get your awards from Rebecca. As they come up, please take a picture, come stand here. And Rebecca, if you could come over as well so that we could take a picture with you. Thank you. Congratulations, Sheila, Eric, and Maria. Well done on the Collaboration Award. You may take your seat. I'm going to invite the next person who's actually going to give out the award. Thank you. So the next award will be given out by a partner, a really important partner from the Siegel Family Foundation, and it will be the award for community-led impact. And Virgil Bahujimigo, I hope I pronounced your name right, will be giving out this award. So Virgil, please come to the stage and you can describe the award. Thank you. Thank you, Shami. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. You all look lovely. I feel like uh, I failed the assignment. I believe there was a memo about us wearing an African print, but uh, um, it must have been in a small print because I didn't see it. But nonetheless, I endeavor to make sure I understand the assignment next time. So my name is Vajil, or Viljil, as my mom calls me. Vahuji Mihigo. So I'm a native son of Rwanda, but uh, no, I'm a native of Rwanda, but a proud son of Kenya, if I may say so. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm here representing the Seagull Family Foundation. Uh, I'm not here alone. I'm here with uh, two of my colleagues. They can wave wherever they are. Okay. So, a, be a brief about the Seagull Family Foundation. We are a private foundation that supports 300 plus uh, organizations in sub Saharan Africa, and 60 of those organizations are here in Kenya. Uh, we have a few here in the crowd, but uh, I won't name names. Uh, we seek to build a community of creative collaborators and you know, interconnected hubs through funding locally-led, community-based grassroots initiatives. We believe that local solutions are the answer to local problems. Without further ado, I want, I'm here to present the Community-Led Impact Award, 
and I'm so proud and privileged to present it to Jeremiah of PICO, or Pastoralist Integrated Concerns. Now, before, <laughs> before Jeremiah comes here, I'd like to share a brief about him. Uh, we've worked with Jeremiah in our Booster Kenya program before, and uh, Jeremiah has had, to, uh, um, has had to overcome many adversities to get to where he is. He was the first in his family to attend uh, university, coming from rural Magadi and navigating the jungle that is Kanairo, where he is able to achieve a degree in chemistry. From then on, he was able to secure a good job, but something in him was not settled. So he, was, he went back to his community and sought to address the barriers and challenges, especially for girls in accessing education. Without further ado, I'm so happy to you know, give him the award. We work with him. He's an uh, awesome gentleman, Karibu Jeremiah. The next award is going to be the Systems Shaping Award given out by Imaginable Futures, which is a partner for this event. And I think, I don't know, I don't see Teresa, but there she is. Okay, great. Welcome, Teresa. Teresa Mbagaya from Imaginable Futures. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you today and also quite an honor to be presenting the next award. My name is Teresa Mbagaya. I work as an impact investor. And what does that mean? It means I give away money. But if you are looking for money, it is not me. I have a colleague, Sam, all the way over there. Sam, do you want to stand up and wave? <laughs> but as an organization, what we think about is how do we support and how do we build truly healthy and equitable systems for learners, for their communities, for our nations. We work across the African continent and have been blessed to be a partner for METIS and many of the fellows who are here today. For this afternoon, I will be providing the Systems Shaping Award. This award goes to Ruth Mugambi, who you heard speak earlier this afternoon, as one of the architects of Kenya's national curriculum known as CBC. In 2019, before the rollout of the curriculum, Ruth knew that its long-term success would be dependent on the support of teachers receive, that the support the teachers receive in order to guide the learners and continuously improve their own teaching practices. With this in mind, she learned alongside others. She, this included her mentors at METIS, at STIR in India, and colleagues such as Dignitas and Kenya's Big Picture Learning on how to truly build professional learning communities, known as PLCs. These are peer learning circles that enable teachers to collaborate, support one another, upskill themselves with new pedagogy and mindsets. The PLCs, uh, many of you may not know this, but are now part of the national policy documents, including the task force report, which Ruth was part of. The quality of education cannot supersede the quality of our teachers, as well as the education officers curric and curriculum developers. We celebrate Ruth, and her pioneering le leadership at KICD as the chair of the CBC Technical Committee for Reform. Your courageous and iterative approach to the national level allows our systems to shift ever more towards equity and excellence. And for that, we present you with the Systems Shaping Award. Congratulations, Ruth.
Thank you, Teresa, and well done, Ruth. <clears throat> the next award is the Equity Warrior Award, which will be presented by um, Naftali Maroki. Where are you, Ms. Naftali? There you go. Good, I wanna say, is it afternoon or evening now? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Naftali Muroki. I am currently the one who hands programs at METIS, and I'm very honored to be presenting this award to this person. <laughs> She'll come at the end as a surprise, <laughs> because um, she's truly inspirational. She's truly, truly inspirational. So last year, no, actually, that's not how I want to start. <laughs> As young people um, in Kenya and across Africa, we are always told that we are the leaders of tomorrow. And this is a continent of young people. So I ask you, what if the continent was actually being led by young people? Last year, when all our schools were closed due to COVID-19, I was fortunate enough to participate in a food distribution program in Riru, Kiambu County. And I was fortunate enough to meet one of the most inspiring young people in Kenya. While studying for an undergraduate degree, she was inspired to start an organization that would feed primary school children in our community and ensure that they did not miss school due to lack of food with contributions from her friends and family, she started the organization. Today, that organization is called Food for Education. They have grown from feeding 25 children in a mixed kitchen to now having distributed of, having distributed or fed more than six million kids over the last eight years. As of today's on Friday, so today Food for Education actually served 30,000 meals during lunch. So, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and help me welcome Wawira Njiru, the founder and executive director of Food for Education. Thank you, Naftali, and well done, Wawira. You're my shiro. <laughs> um, the last award is for liberatory learning, and perhaps this is my favorite one to introduce. I'm super excited to introduce a young learner from the Children in Freedom School, Gumi Galma. Thank you for joining us, Gumi, who will be presenting the Liberatory Learning Award. Thank you, Gumi, for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Gumi Galma. I'm 10 years old and in grade five at Children in Freedom School. I have been at Freedom School since 2018 when it all started. I would like you all to close your eyes. Everyone, we are going to imagine together. Let's all close our eyes. Have you closed them? Imagine that you're far away in a foreign land and you get the revelation that what you need to do with your life is situated back home in Kenya and in Africa. If you are to follow your destiny, you must quit your job, relinquish the comfort of a good salary, say goodbye to a beautiful house, friends and family, and live the life that you have built for over a decade. What would you do? 
Do you choose to stay and keep your comfort zone? Or do you choose to risk everything and follow what you are meant to be? You can open your eyes now. I'm standing here because Engineer Oku and Dr. Uderi Kanayo, the founders of Children in Freedom School, have risked everything to follow their dream. Can we give them a round of applause? In, in 2013, they quit their jobs in the UK and relocated back to Kenya to grow an, a scholarship and Afrocentric mentorship program that later moved into the very first uh, Afrocentric school in the whole of Eastern Africa, Children in Freedom School. I am a beneficiary of this school and a beneficiary of their courage and sacrifice. What if they never came back? Many Africans in the diaspora never come back. Where would I and the hundreds of freedom scholars be? Back in 2017, if you would have told me that a school will be a fun place where I will learn to love my black African self, become multilingual in foreign and language foreign and local languages, be an S in literature, maths, and programming, I would have thought it an impossibility. At Children in Freedom School, we are prepared to proudly embrace our African heritage and not wish to run away from it, as has been the norm. I love my melanin, and I love my genius. I can do anything I put my mind to. And I know that being an African is a great honor and privilege. I come from a country and continent that holds the riches of the world in terms of material resources, youthful human capital and genius and love. Africans are full of Ubuntu. I am because we are and have so much love. I know that I will reach my greatest potential and partner with my peers from all over the world to make this world a better place. Children in Freedom School is an Afrocentric school and a global space combined, a game changer for education in Africa and the world. Thank you, Metis, for working with us when Children in Freedom School was just an idea and was under construction. Thank you, Rebecca Crook, co-founder of Metis, for being a personal coach to our Dr. Uderi Kanayo. You taught her that a school is not a building, but her heart, spirit, and vision. Thank you all to the friends and family of, and colleagues who cheered up D Dr. Uderi and Engineer Oku Kanayo as they ventured into this journey. Thank you, Oku and Uderi, for risking your all to set up the best school, an Afrocentric school that has changed my life and is giving African children the opportunity to know who we are, love ourselves, and embrace our genius. I would like us to go on with the Children in Freedom National Anthem. Whatever I do, I will do with all my heart. I will never give up. I must win, and I will never boast. I will strive to achieve more because I know I will do anything I can put my mind to. So take your time and do your best. Thank you. And, and we, I'm just going to call them out. And we hereby award you the first reimagine a liberatory learning award.
Wow. Amazing, amazing. Can you have your seats? I don't know what you're hearing or what you're feeling or what your take home is, but you must come out of here with something. If you've not come out of here with anything, that's bad. Like you have to come out of here with something. Um, as we think about reimagine, reimagine, amazing. So we have come to the end of our time together. Um, various conversations have happened, collaborations about to, you know, to happen from here. I mean, Blinky has been offered brand ambassadorship right here, you know. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to work together and come up with solutions and collaborate to find solutions for the education sector in Kenya. And so I would like to invite um, Wangari, I'm sorry, Wanjira Madai, I'm so sorry, um, who will do um, the closing remarks. Um, Wanjira is a Metis Cohort 2 fellow. Yeah, we were in the same cohort. <laughs> yeah, um, Wanjira's work in education expands social, emotional wellness to teachers, families, and learners through the Wangari Madai Foundation. We can't forget our teachers, right? Um, she's also Vice President and Regional Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute and a prominent activist, environmentalist, and educationist. Um, welcome, Wanjira, for the closing remarks. Thank you, cohort two. I actually need the thing with all my props. But this, Rebecca, this thing wasn't made for the older, elderly. <laughs> I know. First of all, thank you, Rebecca. This has been outstanding. This has been one of the most beautiful sessions because I know, uh, like many of you, as we walked in these doors, I actually feel sorry for anyone who left early because I've never been more depressed by the stuff that's on those walls. But thank goodness for the session that followed. Thank you very, very much. When I was young, I thought that failure was impossible. All things would be righted in my time. Now I'm old, I know that failure is impossible. So I passed the torch to you, will you hold it high? For we are planting winter wheat that other hands will harvest, that they, not you, not me, might have enough to eat after we are gone. They'll plant shade trees that we will not sit under. We will struggle for justice. We'll never see it flower. Our children's children will live in peace one day. That is reimagining education. All of you here representing that. I want to particularly thank Ruth. Because Ruth, I don't think we've ever met. Yes, please, round of applause for Ruth. Everybody we've listened to today has done amazing things. But on Ruth's shoulders sits the future of all our children and their children's children. So I want all of us in this room today to figure out before we leave how we will support Ruth. A lot is said about the education system and like I said, that room is full of depressing stuff. But I want to know how I can support you. Because CBC must succeed, and I know for sure that the people who are behind the crafting of CBC, it is one of the most progressive, amazing education system, if we see it through. And you cannot do it alone. 
You will need every single one of us. So we, you have my commitment, and everyone in here, I'm going to take their names, Ruth, <laughs> and we're going to follow them. You must succeed, because if you succeed, we all succeed. So thank you so much for what you're doing and for celebrating CBC today, because as we reimagine education, I have to say I was in Glasgow. For those of you, many of you know I, I have two hats. I have the Wangari Mathai Foundation, but I also work in climate change. The most consequential issue in our lives today. Nothing is more important. Not because I work in this sector, but it is the most important thing because our lives simply depend on it. And scientists have told us that we have eight years, eight years. You'll hear that this is the consequential decade. Two years are gone, eight years to get it right. And in Glasgow, we didn't quite get it right. And so anybody who's been asking me, Wanjira, how did, how did the conference go? How was COP? I answer yes. Because any answer you get is true. It was a success, but it was also a failure. A success because we made some progress. A failure because those of us who live in Kenya and generally the global south, are in big trouble, are we in big trouble. And here's the injustice. The injustice is that despite the fact that we are not responsible, hands down, we are not responsible for the increasing climate and the catastrophic impacts that will follow, we will be most disproportionately affected, regardless. And so when I got back, I, Rebecca was one of the first people I called and I said, Rebecca, Actually, education is a crucial part of how we must build resilience. And building resilience means we have to address the underlying drivers of vulnerability that keep us down, that make it impossible for us to survive. The floods, the lack of water, the lack of food. We heard what Wawera is doing every day. It's going to get worse. And I heard the the ne chief negotiator of the, of the European Union, the European Union, talking about how if they don't get it right, their children will be fighting for food. What about us and our children? It'll be much worse. So we have got to get it right. And one of the biggest opportunities is education. And so this reimagining Ed, what Shiro said here, it's a crisis, it is. And I'm not joking when I say we have to rally behind Ruth because this has to work. That to unlock the vulnerability that most of our children face today is to address the education gap. That we might break out of this poverty cycle that keeps us down. It is going to get worse. And so let's all just dig in because it is it is time to reimagine. And I think we have all the tools, we have all the data, we have all the people. And in Kenya, we are lucky. We have the CBC. Let's make it work. So as I said, I walked in these doors uh, and, and I thank God for Soya. She, I don't know if she's here, she, yeah. She sort of uh, interrupted me. I was looking through and I was desperate for a, a silver lining. I said, surely in all of this, there is something that will be hopeful. I went through every last one of them and I was like, no, it cannot be. I don't want to see this. So we're going to have another reimagined exhibit. And that exhibit is going to be full of Uderi, and Oku, and Wihaki, and Metis, and Jeremiah, and Sheila, and Eric, and all the people I saw here. That's the silver lining we have. And I remember you heard about the Wangai Mathai Foundation. We have a mission to nurture a culture of integrity and purpose in children that they might dream big. Dream big. 
But that can only happen if we have that silver lining. Because if you don't have a silver lining, you have nothing to fight for. You have to believe in something. And these, this session just restored every ounce of motivation, energy, commitment, and passion that I have for making all of this work. So thank you, Metis, and thank you for doing this today because if you hadn't done it, um, if anybody left, I, I hope you'll send them the recording because this was really, really good. I love what Blinky said uh, earlier about people, you know, going in one direction, not knowing what you want to do. And, and it's so funny, Blinky, because I listened to Eric Wainaina once, and he said that in every single situation, there are musicians and artists trapped as doctors and neurosurgeons and all sorts of things that our education system needs to free them to be the best that they can be. Because ultimately, in the final analysis, we all want the same thing. We all want the same thing. We all want to fulfill that higher purpose that each of us are meant to fulfill. And it is in the hands of our teachers, mostly, what they say, what they do, how they say it, how they do it, that makes all the difference. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Rebecca. And see you next time as we reimagine together. Thank you, Anjira, um, for the closing remarks. I would like to encourage you to at least see some of the exhibitors that you haven't seen. And most of all, pick a sticky note. There are sticky notes everywhere. Pick a sticky note, write your commitment, and go stick it in the What Now section. Just a com You don't have to write your name. You can write your name if you want to. But just write your commitment and go and stick it there um, after this. So thank you all for coming. We have bitings in the um, terrace, the middle terrace outside um, network. And yeah, we'll see you in the next reimagined. <laughs>